we must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. My name is Brandon Pollan, and I am one of your hosts. And of course, as always, I am joined by my fellow co-hosts, F. Scott Deal and Stephanie Wyrock. And today, we are very, very humbled, and today we have the esteemed pleasure of welcoming Dr. Lori Hack. Who, for those of you who aren't aware, she gave the 49th Macmillan Lecture titled Wisdom and Courage, Doing the Right Thing, which took place at the 2018 Next Conference. And today we brought Lori on the show to talk about some issues and topics regarding education research, and especially also with providing some helpful tips for the current and future education researchers. So Lori, thanks so much for all that your service and all of you've done, because I know your research and work with Gail Jensen and other colleagues has been very helpful and kind of pushing this needle forward with education research. But I know I realize that there are some of our listeners out there who perhaps have not heard of you and maybe don't know a little bit about you. Would you mind just sharing your story about you know, how you started off as a therapist and educator to where you currently are now? Sure. I'm happy to do that, Brandon. And before I start, though, thanks very much for inviting me to do this. It's, it's, uh, it's, I've never done a podcast, so this is a new uh, enterprise for me. Uh, so my whole career has been one of happenstance. I'll just start with that and say I've never been one of these people that this is my three-year goal, five-year goal, 10-year goal. Um, I had one goal when I finished PT school, and that was to leave Ohio. That was my only goal. I'd spent my whole life there. I'd finished graduate school there. I'd left Ohio once for one weekend. And I said, I want to live somewhere else. So I left Ohio and went to the East Coast because I had a lot of friends in college who were from the East Coast. And I interviewed up and down and picked Philadelphia because I liked the people I interviewed with. I probably picked the lowest quality hospital of the places I interviewed, but I liked the PTs I met. So I got there and I got to this city hospital and learned very quickly that no matter how good the PTs were, no matter how how much they helped me or mentored me, the structure of the hospital was so bad that um, the people who were being cared for there were never going to get good health care. There was so much poverty, so, so badly organized. So I said, okay, I've got to do something about this. I was young like you folks, you know, and I said, I got to do something about this. And I went and got an MBA in healthcare at the Wharton School. I was I was in Philadelphia. I didn't know much about the Wharton School. <laughs> you know, it was the closest one. So I went over there and I interviewed and I got in. Um, in order to uh, earn some money while I was going to school, I uh, asked if I could do laboratory teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. They had a PT program. So I started teaching part-time and going to school. By the time I finished my MBA, luckily for me, they had torn down that hospital. It was so bad. So I never felt any obligation to try to go back and save it. But I had learned how much I love teaching. So I um, asked if I could stay on as a full-time faculty member, and I was hired, and I started immediately into my PhD in education and um, went from there. Finished my PhD at about the same month that Penn closed the program that I was teaching in. So uh, then I, uh, three of us who were in that same situation, opened a practice. We ran the practice for about 10 years. We were just sort of really, it was doing education research and clinical care, big wide based practice. And then one of my partners said, I don't want to do this anymore. And she quit. So we had to sell the practice. (laughs) There I was. Okay, I'm out of a job now, second time. And I went back to Temple and taught at Temple for 10 or 12 years and maybe 15 years and then had a 
really big disagreement with um, the dean and it became clear it was best for me to leave. So once again, I was out of a job and this time I just created my own work. Um, and so for the past 10 or 12 years, I've just been putting together, uh, I've been an itinerant faculty member, putting together the work the way I wanted it to be. So that, so that's a very meandering path. It's not one I necessarily recommend, but I do think it's more typical than that I've got this three-year goal or five-year goal kind of thing that they taught you to do while you're in school. <laughs> it doesn't happen in real life. It's yeah. dead life happens. <laughs> no, that's, that's an amazing journey, Laurie, and I, I appreciate your, your sharing that with us. Um, how would you say that educational research has changed overall in the past 10 years to where it is now? So I would say that the actual action of activity of educational research hasn't changed. Um, that, you know, the, the way you go about doing educational research, there hasn't been any great new discovery of techniques. What's different for me is that uh, 20 years ago, the only people I knew doing educational research were Gail Jensen and Kay Shepard. They were the only people, <laughs> you know. So that's changed dramatically. So there, there is now a now much wider range of people uh, doing all kinds of different educational research. So it's been great to see, you know, there's, there's groups of people looking at clinical reasoning. There's other groups, groups of people looking at clinical practice and, and clinical education. Uh, there's people still looking at pedagogy because there's so much we need to learn about classroom pedagogy. So they're, they're now we're beginning to see groups that are able to work together because that's how you really can grow is when you have these cells of people working together. And many of them are, are across institutions across the country. And, you know, technology in the past 20 years has allowed collaboration now in, in so many wonderful ways. So that's what's changed, not educational research per se. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially you kind of mentioning that there weren't that many people initially involved and now how it's grown. And now there's just so many, much a wider array of people looking at different aspects of it. And I've, I've noticed even too, there's been so much call from the organizations to get involved and help with this too, which has actually been very positive. Mm -hmm. and so Lori, with that kind of being said there, what are some of the bigger reasons that you feel like overall, you know, the education research is still having some of the issues that it is with what you had kind of mentioned earlier? Well, I think there, there are several reasons why educational research, and this is not just physical therapy, this is educational research in general, it, it sort of lags behind some others. First off, there's no huge pot of money like the NIH pot of money. There is no, no big funding like that available for educational research. And only recently has there been reasonable pots of money for health services research. I think they're very closely aligned, health services research and educational research. And, and there just wasn't money. So we finally got mo some money, not nearly as much as NIH, but some money for health services research, but there still is very little money for educational research. Now, a lot of it's not all that expensive. It doesn't take big laboratories, but it does take some money. And because of what might even be called a perversion in the way higher education looks at research, they see research now as a funding source. It's not just research for itself, for its intrinsic benefit to the world. It's the funding source. And so they only care about research that's got big pots of money behind it. So there's not as much encouragement or support for uh, educational research because faculty can't get a lot of money. So they don't, that doesn't necessarily help them get promoted and tenure and all those things that happen in higher education. So lack of money is a really big barrier to there being even more educational research. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, a lot of people get their degrees in education because they want to really be good teachers because they're interested in education, not because they want to be researchers. Or they get hired in as the only person with an educational degree on their, their on a faculty, and their job there is to help other people be better educators. Their job there isn't to go out and do research. So again, there's just not this focus on on educational research and, and sort of the credibility and the seeing it as a positive career. That's changing and, and that's what's really good. So those, are, those barriers though are not just PT, they are true in all educational research. Yeah, Laurie, I have to agree with you as, as somebody who's going through an educational doctorate, that's why I originally got into it was because I wanted to be a better teacher and the didactic work helped me get there. And I love that. Uh, I'm so much better at curriculum development. I love that. 
the dissertation, on the other hand, is a different story. I can't say that I love that, and I don't know that I'm going to love research moving forward. So that's where my big uh, yeah. question mark is still to this day. But um, you're 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 right on with that. Well, you know, many EDD programs don't even require a dissertation, so they're they're not about training researchers. Some are, but many aren't, and there really is something to this being trained as a researcher thing. <laughs> you know? So it it really changes your mindset. So th th that's a barrier that we yeah. all need to work on. Absolutely. And Lori, something that I'm, I'm curious about, because I've been hearing this from maybe a lot of other researchers, not just necessarily in physical therapy and education, is the issue with having to pay for access to journal articles. So running into paywalls. Is mm -hmm. that something that is that also a barrier that you guys think as well as contributing or not so much in the education yeah. research realm? Since most of the people that I know who are interested in educational research are in academic settings, that is not a big barrier. APTAs, uh, um, access that you get as an APTA member through PT Now has a fair number of educational journals in it as well. So I don't know how big a problem that is. I don't face that problem <laughs> because I can just go to the temple uh, resources and they're phenomenal. So um, I'm, I don't know. I hope not. I hope it's not a problem. Yeah, you know, Lori, you were actually the person who started the motion for creation of the Education Research Task Force. Uh, two questions on that. One, why specifically did you start this motion? And two, what other strategies to improve quantity and quality of education research have taken place since your original motion? Well, I think the, the reason I wanted to make the motion is that I recognized the section had, through doing very good programming, earned a lot of money and had saved a lot of money. They hadn't been spending it. They hadn't been profligate out there. So there was a good amount of money there. And I thought, you know, we should, we should put this to the use of the members. We should figure out what's best. And I, I thought personally that educational research was a way to spend it. There are other things we could have done. But when I wrote the motion, I was pretty clear. I thought there were a lot of ways we can improve educational research. So money to the foundation is certainly one. Uh, looking with the, the academy, uh, I will forever call it a section, but <laughs> the academy is doing itself to support research. Looking at the journal, uh, having been an editor of the Journal of Physical Therapy Education, I know it needed resources. So that the motion said, look at all of this. Let's talk to our external partners, the foundation and ACAP, and what can we do collectively? Then at the same time, the Educational Leadership Partnership, you know, made up of APTA, ACAP, and the Academy, was looking at what broad things needed to be done to improve physical therapy education, and educational research bubbled right up to the top for them as well. So they've got groups going, doing all kinds of things. The, the Educational Research Mentorship Program, which has now had its second meeting, I think there have been over 150 people who've tended to be mentored. The uh, funding for the uh, Merck programming, the funding for gamers to help people move from, from Merck to help gain some basic skills and then Gamer to actually learn how to get some funding. All of that's been happening at the same time. It's really, I think, a very exciting time to see, you know, when there's that much uh, synergy out there in the, in the world on this topic, things are going to change. Things are going to get better. It's really good. No, absolutely. And it's been really inspiring just to see all that that's been going on. And, and Laura, you had mentioned earlier um, briefly on this in terms of um, educational research, what's needed. And I think you had said uh, more pedagogy more so. Um, when it comes to education research, besides pedagogy, what other specific areas and kind of education research do we need more research on to better help guide our decisions when it comes to education? Uh, well, I still think pedagogy deserves some attention because we've done our pedagogical research in tiny little increments instead of some bigger studies. But I, another area that I think we've totally neglected, and this is really where uh, health services research and educational research intersect, and that's workforce. We know nothing almost nothing about our workforce. Now, APTA has got a lovely workforce model. I was excited to be part of developing that. But if you go read what we said about that, it says, here are all the factors. We don't have any real numbers to plug in to this model, to this formula, to say what's really happening with workforce. So we know almost nothing about our workforce. And we really need to do that. And I, I consider that an important part of educational research. So we keep talking about finding a way to track people from applicants to PT programs to the decision to retire, the whole path. Uh, that happens in medicine. It happens in dentistry. happens in lots of other fields. And we just don't have that data. And without that, we, we can't tell, you know, some basic things like how many PT schools should we have? How many PTA programs should we have? We have no answer to that question. So I, I hope we can answer some workforce questions. 
Yeah. You know, Lori, I think you bring up a lot of good points there and I, I didn't even really think about that. Um, you know, when we think workforce, we think of the people that we help out in the community, but we kind of need to look internally too to our own workforce as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's a whole nother avenue. But let's say that, um, you know, someone has decided they're going to do an educational research study. What are some tips that you would recommend in terms of designing and conducting an educational research study to provide valid data, but also to improve the chances of getting published? So one one thing I would say is, I, I always say this to people, the only thing harder than doing research uh, together is doing research alone. So you, you really don't want to do research alone. You want to find partners. You want to find people to collaborate with who can help you develop your ideas and help do the work. But, but it's that idea development that's sitting alone in a room and banging your head on the wall is really not very productive. So finding partners and including in that group of partners some people who could, who are mentors, who've, who've done it before and who can help point out the direction that's best to go, I think is, is a really important piece. The other thing I would say, and we said this a lot as editors of the journal, do multi-institutional work. We have way too many articles, for example, on oh, what might have contributed to failure rate in the licensure exam at my school in this year. That's as close to useless information as I can think of. We need to know what contributes to failure rate for large numbers of people (laughs) and looking across institutions, because otherwise it's like three this year and two the next year. It's just not enough people to learn anything important. So multi-institutional work, it, it allows us to compare teaching techniques. It's great for pedagogy. It's just really good for lots of things. And it really helps us get the N up if you're doing quantitative work. So those are the two things I would recommend. Find partners and, and use the multiple institutions of the partners to really do some great work. No, and that makes a lot of sense, Lori. I'm going to ask kind of one follow-up to that. So let's say that there are some newer education researchers or there are some people that perhaps want to get more involved with that. Um, apart from what you had mentioned, what are some other helpful resources that you would recommend that those education researchers um, consult when it comes to actually working on the research? Well, I mentioned the Education Research Network, which is so far only met physically, but will within, a, I think, another month have a site and it's going to be cross-linked between the Academy and ACAPT and it's going to be a community interaction. So people will be able to go there and ask questions uh, of specific specific mentors, but of the mentorship group as a whole. So that's going to be a really nice resource, I think. Um, but I would say also then think about joining other groups. You know, uh, the AERA is is wonderful. Go to an AERA meeting if you can. See the way they put together their that research uh, and the richness of the way that's done, uh, because it really allows people to collaborate with each other in the room a- as they're presenting. It's not like our work, where you stand up and you sit down. You know, they really have lots of interaction. So uh, go to those meetings, meet those people, find other groups like that that are, you know, if you're on a medical school campus, go find the all the other people involved in uh, looking at pro- particularly professional education. It, it's all good, but we are about professional education, and it's a little different than other education. So find other people, e- even if they're not in PT. So what was the process like for preparing your Macmillan lecture? I went to it. I thought it was amazing. I just love hearing the Macmillan lecture because they are so incredibly inspiring. So tell me what it was like preparing for that and what advice you would give to future Macmillan lectures. Well, preparing for it, people told me they were nominating me and I kind of laughed at them. I said, oh, you silly people, why are you wasting your time doing that? Uh, And when I got the call from Sharon to tell me that I'd gotten it, I was driving and I I nearly drove off the road. (laughs) I was so shocked. So they tell you in March, but they don't announce it till June. So you have to keep it an absolute secret for like three or four months. So that was stressful, keeping it a secret. And then they announce it in June. And in August, you have to give them a title and a paragraph that they use in publishing and in, in, in promoting the talk. So I had to pretty make up my mind pretty quickly, the, the general areas. So that was pretty stressful over the summer. And, and luckily for me, I had some friends over, three PTs and their husbands. <laughs> and we had a wonderful talk about my talk, and they really helped me think of things and helped me hone some ideas, which uh, got me to the point of the wisdom and courage combination that I ended up doing. And then, so that was in August, and I spent the next uh, August through May agonizing over every word. 
That's the only way I can put it. I've never agonized so much over anything in my life. So, you know, you write and then you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite because it's just, you know, you get this one chance at doing this thing. So it, it really was the hardest thing I've ever done. And as I've said to people who would write and congratulate me, I'd say it is both the, the biggest honor and the scariest thing that's ever happened to me all wrapped up in one. I tried hard to uh, use both, you know, my career, everything I've learned over my career, as well as making sure I've read a lot of new things and made sure I tried to make sure I was getting things right. I didn't want to say anything that was incorrect. So I spent a lot of time going back to references. And it actually was harder to write than a dissertation, I will tell you, Scott. <laughs> Scott's shaking his head. You, people can't see him. Yeah, it, no, it was I'm, harder. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. We've had other Macmillan lecturers on and they all kind of say the same thing. It's a year of terror. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never yeah. forget that. That was so funny when Gail Jensen first said this. Like, then you find out the news and then you have a year of terror that started. Yeah. And I will say when I stood up there to give it, it was just plain fun. Because it was done and the setup was so perfect. So I could, uh, I, I, I looked like I'd memorized it, even though it was on a teleprompter at the back of the room. And I just had fun in that hour, you know. So uh, it, it was quite a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah, well, and you awesome. certainly did look pretty calm when you did. I was like, wow, she's actually do being very calm with it. <laughs> well, it was fun. It was really, it was fun to do. It wasn't fun to prepare but it was fun to deliver. Well, Laurie, your lecture titled Wisdom and Courage, Doing the Right Thing was really well received at the conference. And you did a great job bringing up some key issues and solutions to better our profession. For our listeners who have not heard the lecture, what are the highlight points and key takeaways that you mentioned in your lecture? Well, I, I'm happy to to offer that, Scott. I will say, if people want to know more than, than this, I'll, I'll give a little plug. There's a, a lovely interview that Jason Bellamy did that he was really fun to, to work with, and that's up at APTA. And the video of the whole talk is going to be there by the end of the week, by the 1st of November at the latest. Awesome. And, we, can, uh, we can link that uh, in the show notes for sure. That would be awesome. And, and they printed it in the October Journal. So uh, it's also there. So if people want to hear more about it or read it or I don't know who wants to go watch the whole hour, but but maybe read the article. It, th those things are now out there for public con consumption. So uh, for those people who weren't there, it was this wisdom and courage. So it's sort of two parts. And the, in the wisdom piece, I primarily wanted to talk about is everything we've learned in the past 25 years or so about behavioral economics, uh, about how we have these biases in our thinking and that um, we are not rational human beings most of the time. Instead, we have these, these problems in our thinking, but we can learn to overcome them. And um, I borrowed heavily, of course, from all of the wonderful scholars who have worked in this area. And I, I always try to give credit. My husband is one of these scholars. So he was checking my facts on this the whole time. Um, if, if people are interested in learning more about this, the, the best book I could recommend is Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman, who got a Nobel Prize in behavioral economics, but he's a psychologist. This is not an economics book. It's, it's just great reading. It's a New York Times bestseller. And so I really recommend that. The other thing I tried to weave in was what I think about evidence-based practice, which is that it's really three things. It's not just slavish finding the right article to give you the right information to make a decision. It's finding the right evidence, combining it with good clinical decision-making all the time, respecting patients' values and, and their, and their decision-making, and that it's the meld of those three that really makes for best practice. So, so that was sort of on the wisdom side. On the courage side, I think the one of the biggest things I hope people took away was that I think we really need to recognize our responsibility as a profession to improve the health of society, not just by being good PTs. That's really lovely. And we contribute a lot. But we have to take responsibility for helping with the health inequities and improving the social determinants of health. If people don't have enough food to eat, then they certainly can't develop stronger muscles. If they live in, in neighborhoods where it's not safe to walk outside, then they can't enjoy the benefits of movement. So we're, we should be obligated to work on those kinds of issues just as much or more than we're obligated to work on improving payment for PT services. So those were sort of my big points. 
I love that. And I think we've been seeing a lot, especially on not even just social media, but I think things in general is that there's been such a drive to focus so much on the evidence. And I, I wonder too, and actually when I interviewed Tim Furon, his big concern is that we're becoming evidence driven rather than evidence based. Mm -hmm. And like you had kind of said, it's kind of that integration of all the key points rather than just letting the pendulum swing too far towards one side. So I think that's a very, very important point and a big issue. And, you know, I, I realize that it's probably very early as it hasn't been a long time since you've delivered this lecture. Um, but I'm just curious, where do you feel that we as a profession now overall stand in regards to your recommendations that you made in your lecture? Well, you're right. It's a little hard to tell. <laughs> I will say that a lot of things happened at Next that all spoke to this social con issue. So I was working in, in my little space here, working on that topic. Uh, and at the same time, the APTA board was doing some things that really spoke to social issues. And in the House of Delegates in June, the House, for the first time in a long time, was willing to take some effort towards some social issues. And uh, Sharon Dunn, our president, gave a wonderful presidential address talking about the same obligation. So it was kind of like, you know, all of these points of interest came together. So it's kind of like that educational research thing we talked about a few minutes ago. There seem to be a whole lot of people right now really interested in, in seeing the APTA as our professional association, but certainly all of physical therapy recognize this obligation and then find ways to meet that obligation. So one example I'll give that I think was really exciting was we actually supported that the essential benefits list be maintained in the ACA. So this was in opposition to where a current political one political party is. We actually made a statement that was something that had some people who were for it or against it. It wasn't just about PT. It was here's a package of essential benefits that everybody needs to be healthier. It isn't just to get better PT. And the, the board uh, made a strong commitment to that in, in letters to Congress and to the White House and, and to the Department of Health. So it was just wonderful to see that. So I hope my talk didn't initiate that because it all happened at one time, but I hope that it helped people see that this is the right thing to do and that we continue to do more of it. I think that it's really important that, that we are making more of these social stances. Um, I am a frequenter of reading JAMA and I know in JAMA, especially after a lot of these mass shootings has, have happened, there have been a ton of publications um, with JAMA coming out with statements on mass shootings and physicians coming out with student, with statements on mass shootings. And I think that it's important that as healthcare professionals, we are involved, like you said, because population and health is really important. And some of these social issues are really important for us to initiate so that we can continue to improve the health of, our, of society. Mm -hmm. And I know throughout this entire conversation, Lori, you've been talking about different aspects of physical therapy education that you would like to see improved or have changed throughout your years as a physical therapist. But we finish our interviews with this very specific question to everyone, and I'm interested to know how you would answer it. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education in physical therapy or another healthcare profession, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Yes, I, I got that question to think about. <laughs> and I, I have to say, I'm not sure I have a specific thing. To me, what I would like to see is all educational programs move to a stronger emphasis on people practicing at the very top of their game. That, that we think is people talk about practicing at the top of your license. And, and, and that's an okay phrase, but I would say that, that the point is that we find a way for, for quality care, the delivery of quality care and commitment to our patients and to society is the most important thing we look for in our applicants. It's the most important thing we instill on in our students. And, and, it's, uh, and this is true for entry-level education, residency education, continuing education, that we really have to move. And I, I, I commented on this in my talk. We cannot allow as much mediocrity as we have. We're all real clear that's bad practice. We'll get rid of the, that bottom stuff that's bad practice. But we got a big range of mediocre practice. And we really need to, uh, we, we need to quit having mediocre education and mediocre practice. And we've got to move the bar up for everybody. And, and it, for me, that partly means moving away from what I would consider technical education. 
I think an awful lot of, too much of physical therapist education is still focused on technical skills rather than teaching people reflection. I would rather graduate a reflective practitioner than one that has precise mechanical technical skills. So I, that's a broad answer to your question, but it's, and, and, and if you'd ask me, how do I, how do I know when that's happening? I'd say, well, I know it when I see it. <laughs> so. No, I think that's a great answer. And we've had a couple people in the past who have had answer, an answer similar to that. And, you know, this has been such an insightful interview, Dr. Hack. If, if people want to follow up with you after this interview, where should they, where can they reach you to ask a question? Uh, they're welcome to email me, lhack001 at temple.edu. And if they don't remember that, I'm in the member directory. People forget what a wonderful resource the APT member directory is. You, you know, you can, if a person's a member, you can find contact information for them. Um, I'm pretty good on email. I, I would prefer that to Facebook messaging or to texting. So I'm old fashioned enough that I'm still email. But um, I'm pretty good about responding to email pretty quickly, too. Well, perfect. Well, Lori, thank you so much for your insight and for, again, your service throughout everything you've done thus far. Because I think, like you said, the points in your lecture and all that you've done have really helped push some things forward. And I think as long as we continue to push that message out there, I think things will continue to change the rate they are. But thank you so much for your time oh, and for sure. coming Thanks on. Thanks for asking me. It's been yeah. fun. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.